Stiekem 18 jaar. Ja, ik heb het gezien. Ja, we gaan. Oké. during the coffee about uh, practice exams and we had them already uh, uploaded to Canvas but I just actually opened the corresponding form. So uh, it's called exam preparation materials and it has the last four years of the exam. Yeah. So we didn't want to put that up at the, because there's a the balance to when and how much information uh, we, we give you guys. We give everything at the start, then, uh, then you don't know where to start. Okay. Um, so that's that's online now. Thanks for the reminder. Okay, now we go... Yes. This one? Uh, the, can you check? It's, it's running? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right this way. Okay. Yeah, if it's a wiper and I put it there, I don't mind. But it goes in my pocket. Okay. Uh, oh no, we were we were we were further along. Did, did somebody been going back looking at the previous slides? Because we were here, right? Uh, sorry, here. Yeah. Uh, so who figured it out? Without cheating. So what happens if you add these two up? <coughs> so you lose all the terms with the uneven exponentials? Yeah, so if you, if you add this up, you get just both of them. You get this is 2QT. Well. Yeah. This is plus and minus. <laughs> so you lose them, right? <coughs> this is interesting because now it looks like your the your next coordinates are not going to depend <laughs> on your velocities because you lose your velocities here. Yeah. Uh, this one you keep because it's this plus that, and then interestingly, this is two faculty. What's two faculty? Two. two. So this is half. So this is half. And half is one. Yeah. So you lose the half, uh, and this one cancels. Yeah. This is plus or minus. Add them up. So this is what you. 
get if you push cooperating. Yeah. So you get uh, Q T plus delta T, so the next coordinates plus the previous coordinates uh, equals two times the current coordinates. That's a strange value. Uh, plus two times a half uh, the acceleration times delta T squared. Yeah. Now we can rewrite re this where we shift the uh, Q T minus delta T, so the previous coordinates to the right. So now we have, because we want to have a formula for the next coordinates, right? <laughs> so we have 2 Q, Q minus Q T minus delta T, so that's a pre the, there's a current coordinates, previous coordinates, times acceleration times delta T squared. Now the final thing we can do is to realize that Q T minus Q T minus delta T, so that's the current coordinates minus the previous ones, what is that? That's your velocity. It's the difference. That's like uh, uh, the velocity is your is your uh, derivative of the of the of the coordinate. This is your this is your discrete velocity. Yeah, this is just the <coughs> difference of the dif differential. That's your difference. Yeah, but it's not the co it's not the velocity at t or t minus delta t. It's actually the average velocity over that period, which is best approximated by the velocity halfway. <coughs> yeah? do, you, do you get that? If your velocity is changing, if you if you if you have your velocity as a function of time, <coughs> yeah, and your this is uh, your 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 time t. And this is your next time step, and this is your velocity here, and this is your velocity there. Yeah? Then, uh, sorry, coordinates. The coordinates. Yeah? <coughs> then your um, this difference <coughs> is not related to this coordinate or that, but it's related to your velocity halfway. It's the slope of this line in between. The slope of this line is your velocity. But the velocity could be changing as well. Yeah? Uh, is there a delta t missing in the equation? Yes, probably. <laughs> yeah. Velocity times delta t. Thank you. Let me fix that. So, so no, to come back to your question, actually, it, it's there. Yep. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so, um, so now the funny, so the interesting, so now we have a nice formula. So the, the co coordinates of nice of the coordinates of the next time step are the current coordinates. I'm not sure about this minus. I don't like the minus here. No, there must be plus. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, here we go. Uh, oh. So, uh, the coordinate coordinates plus the uh, half times that velocity <coughs> times delta t plus your acceleration times delta t squared. So your coordinates change with your velocities and a little bit with your acceleration. Of course, your, veloc your velocities also change with your acceleration. Yeah, but that's a different calculation. Okay. There's actually in the new version of the book, I actually wrote uh, a, a, a pseudocode for the algorithm of the MD integration, and then you can see a little bit more detail of how these these things go. I didn't think I would have time in the lecture to put that on the slide. Okay, so the cool thing about this, mathematically, we're taking only uh, uh, terms up to the second 
uh, uh, order, like double three squared, um, and avoiding further uh, further terms actually makes our computation less uh, less complicated and faster. But because uh, we didn't ignore the third order term, we just got rid of it by a simple trick. So the, the, the integration is actually has third order accuracy. This is really cool because that means uh, the um, the integration actually doesn't it doesn't only take into account how the velocity changes according to an acceleration because that's explicitly in it, but it also takes into account implicitly how the acceleration changes. Yeah, and that that means if you're if you're thinking about a simple um, a simple notion like a um, uh, a harmonic oscillator, which which is like a sine wave, if you have a coordinate as a function of time, it will do something like this, right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is like a, this is what a harmonic oscillator will do. It's a sine wave or a cosine. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Cool. Stay. <laughs> yeah. So now you're, what you're doing with your integration is that you're starting at, ta at ta time t. You have a certain velocity, and then you say, okay, this is going to be my new position. You have a certain velocity. This is going to be my new position. Now you're off. Yeah, because the, the velocity here is just the um, I didn't write, didn't write it very nicely. The velocity here is the. Um, <coughs> Now I have the Dutch word, the Pechtingskoosje. Uh, the slope, yes. Thank you. The slope of your, of your curve here. Right? So if you only include the velocity, you'll go on straight in the direction that you're going there. That means you're overshooting your next position. If you also take into account the uh, acceleration, that's the change in velocity, then, you'll, then you might actually end up here. Or you hope to end up here, right? That's what, because that's what you want if you want to integrate this uh, accurately. Now you can imagine that if you also uh, if your if your computation doesn't take into account the change of uh, acceleration, you might still not end up in the right spot there. Yeah? So if you take a slightly larger time step, like uh, let's say double the time step, uh, this might still go go fine. But this is a big change, right? Because now everything goes the other way around. Yeah, so if you if you would only have second order, then you might underestimate the amount of change in your acceleration and then up there. Or maybe you overestimate your, your change in acceleration and then you end up there. Yeah, so the, 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 the Verlet integration scheme actually makes sure that you do <coughs> include the, uh, the effects of the change in acceleration. So you end up. So you can actually you can actually integrate uh, a harmonic oscillator with what actually looks like quite ridiculously large time steps, but something on the order like this. Yeah? These are supposed to be equidistant in time. So that's just my uh, limited drawing skills. Yeah? Um, and so this looks maybe like it's too linear, but all the points are on the on the right curve. That's the important part. It doesn't really matter whether the, you can draw a, line, a, straight, a straight line between these <coughs> two points. OK. Um, that's enough about integration accuracy. Other questions about this? No? Then we can go back to the slides. Then uh, a little bit about efficiency. Um, the limit actually, for, uh, as I showed here, the limit of your time step is, is related to your uh, vibrational frequency. And that means if you're simulating a linear protein system, whatever vibrates the fastest uh, will be the limit to your time step. Yeah? There's all sorts of fancy tricks where you say, oh, but there's only fast vibrations here, so I do extra time steps here, but only slow time steps uh, in the other part of my system. That, that's possible in some cases, but it's tricky. 
Um, the, the fastest vibrations are things like the, uh, the hydrogen, the, the backbone hydrogen, because it's very light, and it, so it, it vibrates back and forth um, with respect to the rest of the, of the backbone. And this is on the order of 10 femtoseconds vibration frequency. So it means uh, you need about uh, one or two femtosecond time step to get uh, reasonably accurate uh, integration. So five, so this is about one, two, three, four, five time steps per, uh, per period. Yeah? So if your period is 10, you need a two femtosecond time step. That is pretty short. Now let me skip to the next slide to show you exactly how short that is. Um, two femtoseconds is about here, well, actually lower. This is a femtosecond, so two femtoseconds on the logarithmic scale is only <coughs> a little bit above this, right? Uh, so this is your time step. So, so, so if you do uh, a billion integration steps, 10 to the 12, then you've arrived at microseconds, and that's where you see the first hints of what might be biologically relevant functional protein motions. That way you're looking at transitions between an activated state of a receptor and an inactive state, or between um, outward open and inward open uh, conformation of a, uh, of a uh, ligand channel in a membrane, uh, things like that. And also, uh, fast protein folding is in, in the order of microseconds, tens, hundreds of microseconds. But that's billions of integration steps. Yeah? So that, that's what makes, and if, if each integration step takes a millisecond, maybe, when I started doing this stuff, it, would took, it, it took 10 to 20 seconds per integration step. Yeah? Now it may be milliseconds, but you can calculate how long it takes, right? Okay, so uh, you can do some, some tricks. So I already mentioned that uh, bonds between atoms are typically not uh, modeled as a harmonic potential, but they're just fixed. Uh, bonds with hydrogens uh, should also be fixed. There's a, I, I actually did a paper uh, on the years ago uh, to work out how to do that nicely in, in protein molecules. So you can remove this, uh, this uh, not just the bond vibration, that's easy, but also the angle vibration. Um, and then you can go to uh, five or seven femtosecond time steps, which is helps. It's a factor of three uh, compared to two femtosecond time steps. So that means uh, you you don't need uh, a billion time steps, but, <laughs> but only a few. What does it say? Trillion. You don't need trillions of time steps, but only a few hundred. And billion times mm -hmm. That's sort of a lot better. Yeah. But it, to put it differently, you don't need three months of simulation time, but only one month. Yeah? Okay. Or you, you still use the three months, but you simulate three microseconds instead of one. Or, yeah. Anyway, it's, it's an increase in uh, inefficiency. I was just thinking the other day, would that paper be, because it's actually my most cited paper, would, would, would I be able to calculate whether that has an effect on the carbon footprint of the uh, of computational uh, methodology? Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, because I'm pretty sure that actually most people will just use their three months of CPU time and simulate longer instead of simulating shorter. So I don't think it will actually have an effect on that. Okay. Um, so where is, where is most of the computational work going into in a simulation? Any idea? We already saw a hint of that in the force field, right? So it's not the bonded interactions, because they're just linear with the number of atoms. It's the non-bonded interactions, because they're quadratic. Yeah? And of course, you can. there's some tricks to, to limit that, but it's still quite a lot of interactions. So where do you find most non-bonded interactions in your protein system? Hmm? At the surface. So interactions with what? Water. With water. So the protein water interactions are the are the dominant thing in the in the computational uh, uh, 
You're close, but you're not quite there. Because if you have, if you have, let's say, a thousand atoms of protein, and you want to put a bit of water around that, how many atoms of water would you have? Let's say ten thousand at least. Yeah. Uh, probably more like fifty or a thousand or so. But let's say ten thousand, right? So that means you have uh, on the order of a thousand times ten thousand protein water interactions. But you have ten thousand times ten thousand water water interactions. So about ninety five to ninety eight percent of all the calculation in your protein simulation is just interactions between the water. They're completely uninteresting. But if you don't do that, the water doesn't behave like water. And if the water doesn't behave like water, the protein doesn't behave like a protein. Well, it behaves like a protein in something that's not water. It seems very interested in the biological properties of the proteins, typically in water or a watery environment. So we need to have, get the, the, the water to behave like water. So uh, to make it visible, this, this is what a protein in water looks like. If you was, <coughs> We're looking carefully. So you might have seen water at some point in your in a, in a PV structure. It's typically drawn. I should have made the delay a little bit larger. It means too slow all the time. Now so far, because here you see water in this the first <coughs> second. You see water as lines, right? And it doesn't look like so much. But if you draw them with their with the atoms with their van der Waals radius. Then it looks like this. All the red is, uh, is the uh, oxygen in your water. The white is hydrogen. If you look very carefully, you can see like a fraction of one protein atom here and a fraction there. Okay. So this is uh, this is a visible, visual impression of how much water you need in a typical protein system to uh, to be able to simulate. Okay. Um, there's some more tricks we can do to improve uh, performance. We already covered the fact that the interactions are pairwise and they're, they're symmetrical. So that means if you know Fij, you know Fji. Uh, we can uh, approximate our normal interactions uh, up to some distance, or from some distance onward as being zero. So we can ignore a lot of these Ij uh, quadratic terms. Uh, and the cool trick is to actually consider that atoms at a long distance, the, uh, the atoms that are further away in the system, they, they move, but uh, their movement is very small compared to the distance that they have. <coughs> so that also means that the interaction between them doesn't change that much. Yeah, so you can actually uh, only update those longer interactions every 10 steps or so. Because it will be tiny changes in, it will move like maybe 0 0.01 angstrom at a distance of 10. That's completely negligible in terms of the change in, in the interaction. <coughs> so you do this update only uh, every so many steps. Um, and related to that is the fact that you actually need to calculate the distance. Oh, correct. And uh, the distance mean, means uh, square root. And the square root is expensive to calculate. And also because you need to do it for uh, all pairs of atoms. So how? F so now there is a... Uh, do I have time to go into that? Yeah. Sorry. Um, but think about how would you know which atoms to include in your long-range interaction uh, if you want to say, okay, I, I calculate everything up to 2 nanometers and I ignore everything beyond 2 nanometers. But you still have to calculate the distance to <coughs> know which atoms are beyond the nanometers. There's a trick to that. It's called neighbor searching. Uh, or it's, it's called actually grid searching <coughs> neighbor searching. Okay. Uh, ask me during the practical um, Then there's all sorts of uh, more uh, fancy uh, things for uh, large distances. There's all sorts of technical stuff that I was already flashing by. Uh, this is not so important anymore. C has become, C compilers have become very good, but people used to use Fortran to make it faster. Even assembly code, that's still used, particularly for GPUs. GPU compilers aren't very good. Uh, so if you write a GPU assembly code yourself, you can 
they proved by five to ten fold often. Uh, things about cash performance and so on. The GPUs are already mentioned. Okay. And uh, uh, oh yeah, uh, the final thing that's that we this, that these are sort of this has been done already for decades. Um, if you really need to go to longer time scales, you you basically have no well, or the idea have to be very very patient. Uh, but what, what actually works reasonably well for many applications is using a uh, simplified force field, they're called coarse grained force fields, where you don't put all the details of all the atoms in. Uh, but for example, for proteins, you just have one bead in the backbone that just represents the protein backbone, one bead per, per residue, and then no, or one, or two, or three uh, beads representing the, the rough shape of the side chain. Yeah. So you can imagine that this is a very quite crude approximation. It still works. It depends on what you what you want to know about your system, whether you need that detail. Yeah. Uh, so if you don't need that detail, or if you really need the longer time scales, much more than you need the fine details, then uh, that that's actually the way to do it. And so we'll actually so we'll actually be using a coarse grained fossil in the in the third assignment for calculating proton to interaction. Because there, if the, the long time scales are much more important than all the fine atomic <coughs> interaction details. Um, final one that I want to mention so, there's all sorts of ways that people try to avoid having all the water in the simulation because that really clears up a lot of computational effort. Uh, the problem is that uh, the, 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 the behavior of the protein really depends on making these explicit hydrogen bonds with actual water molecules. And to get that balance right, with without having all the water molecules there, that's uh, that's still not be not not possible. Uh, so this is this makes your simulation very fast in this water models, but it also usually destroys your protein-like behavior of your protein model. But that's not uh, that's not the way to do it. Okay, uh, we have some time left for the examples. Good. Uh, <coughs> I'm just going to try another battery. This was, this was the one I wanted to give me the last one. It should not be empty over here. It's only better. One of them is too cool. So uh, I think I showed you this protein before. It's a uh, it's a cytochrome P450 uh, bacterial uh, cytochrome P450 enzyme. Uh, uh, all the, I think all uh, all living organisms have, have them. They have a major role in detoxifying uh, compounds that that <coughs> come from the environment into the cell. Um, and this one actually no. Uh, this one is not even there. So annoying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this one actually binds uh, fatty acid molecules, amongst other things. And uh, so you see a group here in the middle. You see the fatty acid molecule here. Uh, I don't recognize it, but one of the ends must be red, which is the oxygen sector. So you can't see it. Anyway. Mm -hmm. One one is red? Yeah. yeah, thank you. I really can't see it. Uh, so that's the uh, that's the oxygen of the carbons. Hmm? Turn light, please. Turn light, yeah. Like this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, now I want to start it again. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so this is actually the result of molecular dynamic simulation, right? And uh, uh, been done quite a while ago. You, you recognize helices, uh, beta sheets, and so on. Uh, one important thing to notice is that everything is moving all the time. Yeah? Um, but the overall structure <coughs> is quite stable. So for example, you see this helix at the top, where the, the, the right end is actually moves out of the frame. Uh, it, it's, it's going up and down. I think if you ask DSSP, uh, not all of this helix will be helix all the time. 
but the overall shape of the helix is the remain stable. So it fluctuates out of helix and back into helix again. Um, so that's that's one uh, sort of major feature of uh, of, of uh, molecules at this uh, at this atom atomic scale that uh, everything fluctuates all the time, but it's still stable. Yeah? And this also this is also why we need to consider the the statistics of uh, of all these conformations to be able to say anything about the stability of the molecule. This is entropy in action. Yeah? All this all this wriggling around, uh, all these fluctuations means that there is uh, entropic freedom, if you like, in this state, the stable state, which is the native uh, state of this enzyme. Um, there's a lot of um, emotional freedom for the molecule to fluctuate. And if it doesn't have that, if you force it to be rigid, then it has to be very energetically stable to be able to, to be stable, right? Um, but uh, that means you probably can't break it down. Uh, we mentioned that uh, previously, I don't know if it was yesterday or last two, two weeks ago, but anyway, uh, if, you, if you can't break down the molecule, you'll quickly have a problem in your cell, because then you, your cell will eventually be full of that whatever <coughs> protein that you can't break down anymore. Okay, so, um, yeah, so now, but looking at movies is cool, because it gives you some feeling of what this molecule do, but uh, how can we make a little bit more uh, quantitative analysis of these, uh, well, turn off the light again, of, of, of what happens in this, in this uh, simulation. You've, both of you have done biosystems data analysis last month, right? Two months ago. Yeah? So you know what a principal component analysis is. Yeah? So you look for, for basically uh, correlated um, uh, correlations between the uh, input data that you uh, that your the data set that you're looking at. Now, if you if you consider your atomic coordinates as just another set of uh, of data vectors, you can do PCA well not directly on the atomic coordinates. You do it actually on the uh, on the covariance matrix of the atomic coordinates. Uh, then you get something that's you that's called uh, by some people essential dynamics analysis, but it's just principal components of your atomic motions. And the cool thing is that uh, you can immediately get sort of a, an intuitive feeling of what these eigenvectors mean, because they're just collective modes of motion. So it's just m if you go along this eigenvector, it means there's a lot of mo there are a lot of atoms that are moving uh, together with each other. Not all the atoms will move uh, the same amount of uh, distance. Some move more, others move less. Uh, some move in one direction, others move in a different direction. Yeah, but they move all together. So this looks a little bit like, yeah, like this. Yeah. So you can actually, like you do the simulations, you can visualize uh, this eigenvector, vector, um, and it looks like this. So you can see actually here this this big fluctuation of this uh, helix at the top is actually correlated with this banner sheet part at the bottom left, which is moving. Uh, sort of counterclockwise, or counterwise compared to the other one. Right? You can't, you don't have a direction here anymore, because you don't know from from this analysis, you don't know whether you're moving right in this eigenvector or left. Yeah. And then you can look at a different eigenvector, like the second one. Um, it will take a while for whatever reason. It should come up. It probably comes up as soon as I'm there. No, it's even slower. Come on, you can do it. Yeah. Okay. So the other one looks. So this looks maybe a little bit similar, but now if you remember this motion, you can see that this one is moving here. The parts that are moving are similar, but they're moving in a different direction. Yeah. So if if the one is moving like this, then the other one is moving like that. Uh, so now you can actually. Um, untangle all these fluctuations into a limited set of global motions that might not all of them make immediate sense, but at least uh, it's, it's an easier way to compare these uh, simulations. So now what the, the, the thing in the background is, so these are just visualizations of these eigenvectors. But using these eigenvectors, you can, you can make a PCA plot 
of your trajectories and then different points in this two-dimensional projection are different conformations. Yeah? Um, different conformations can also land in the same spot in the projection. So if, if two spots are in the same place, doesn't mean they have the same conformation. But they're in that's the same with that's also what you get with PCA. You can't you can't find all the differences in your PCA projection. But if they if two points are in different locations, you know they have different conformations. Yeah? And the, the cool thing here, so there's there's these labels 3M, 1M, and 2M, those are single, double, and triple mutants of the active site of this enzyme. And you can see, and there's a couple of triple mutant simulations here, and a couple of double mutant simulations, and a couple of single mutant simulations. The white is the wild pack, by the way, it could be labeled 0M. Um, and you can see that they do different things, because they move in different directions. In this plot, but also literally in, in, in the simulation, which is almost impossible to to actually see when you're looking at these. Because if, if your brain looking at these fluctuations of, 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 of this protein structure, it just, we just see fluctuations. We can't, our visual system is not, uh, not trained, not developed to be able to understand that it's actually mostly these two motions on top of each other with a lot of noise. And that this can be different between different simulations. We, don't, we can't see that. Okay. So this is uh, essentially the dynamic analysis, which is my first tool of choice uh, to analyze some of the AMD simulation. You've also uh, <coughs> heard of RMSD, RMSD root mean square deviation. Yeah? So one way to, to think of, uh, to think of, of an essentially dynamic pop is like a two-dimensional RMSD analysis, because you have two directions in which your confirmation comes in. Yeah? Okay. Uh, this is one example. The other one is actually uh, the multi-modelic model optimization that I already mentioned uh, earlier. And let me actually do a few minutes. So this is what it looks like. It's also an enzyme. Uh, I, I, before I became a postdoc in Yavuzkut 20 years ago, I was postdoc in, at uh, chemistry here at the VU. This uh, is chemistry or looking at enzymes. Um, and, um, so this is actually the enzyme. It's a it's a monooxygenase. So it oxygenates oxygenates uh, an organic compound. It's a styrene in this case, um, and it, it needs a, an FAD cofactor, which you can see over here. And uh, the thing was that we didn't have a structure. For so for the other one that I showed you before, we had a crystal structure. For this one, we didn't have a crystal structure, but there was a, a, there was there was a homologue with about 18% or 20% sequence identity. That's fairly low. Uh, fortunately, most of the uh, active site um, region and the cofactor binding site <coughs> were much more conserved than that. They were about 50% identity. So that's nice because that means that you, it's, uh, you know at least that you get the alignment of those parts of your structure correct. And you, you all know from, from the previous assignment how important it is to get your alignment correct. Small changes in your sequence alignment will have huge impacts in your structure. Right? I didn't have to worry about that too much, certainly not in the active site region. And if you're a chemist, the active site region is basically the only, uh, only uh, area that you care about because the rest is just fluff. Yeah? Um, also, maybe from, a, from an evolutionary point of view, uh, you can look at it that way. Because if, the, if the, the catalytic function is what the protein does, uh, who cares about the rest of the protein as long as it supports whatever they need to be doing in, in the center. Okay, so that's the uh, background here. Uh, ooh. <coughs> Five minutes at most. Okay, so what we did here, so we built this rough uh, homology model, we docked in the styrene molecule and a couple of other known uh, ligands, and they, um, uh, they, they, came, they came in, they, they fitted in the active site cavity, but not in the right orientation. I won't go into the details, you can ask me later if you want. So that's why we did, decided to do this, this MD simulations, and I came up with a scheme which I called control release optimization. So you first, uh, you put restraints on all, the, on all the atoms so that they can't move too much, uh, and you first put restraints on the whole protein, and then you simulate uh, for about 
on picoseconds uh, to to uh, to allow the water around the protein to settle down. So you get the interactions, either hydrogen bonds at the surface to get that light and so on. Um, then I made a distinction between the binding residues, so the residues around the, the ligand binding site and the, um, uh, the color factor binding site, because I kept them fixed. But I released the side chains of all the, let's say, peripheral residues. So they could relax uh, and find good conformations and hydrogen bonds and packing and, and so on. Um, then I released also their backbones, so the users could start shifting a little bit or, or distort or uh, adapt. Uh, and then and then simulated a little bit longer. And then finally I released uh, only the side chains of the uh, binding side residues, still keeping their backbone fixed, so that the side chains would allow, would first be able to um, settle down uh, without changing the overall structure of these binding sites. And so this was my uh, this was my uh, uh, procedure. The link is, uh, is up down, down here. Then um, I did a couple of uh, free MD simulation under strain, just uh, from from this final structure. Um, and I docked the ligand in, and then I found actually it was docked in the right orientation. The right orientation here, so this ligand is flat, it's symmetrical, but it binds in one orientation so that the product is actually chiral. You get one stereo or enantiomer of the product. <coughs> if it binds in the wrong, the, the, the wrong orientation, then you get the other stereo isomer. And experimentally, it was known that you like hit like 98% of, of this or of the product that you, that you would expect from this orientation. And that's how we knew which orientation we had to get. Um, okay, so then, uh, so to actually oh, to actually visualize what happens during the uh, the optimization, I again use this essential dynamics analysis, and uh, that looks a little bit like this. So I had the raw model from which I did a couple of MD simulations, and this is those are the red traces, red traces, red red traces. Oh, um, and you can see actually they shoot out in different directions. And the shooting out means there's a lot of en energy in the starting state. It means there's, there's flashes, atoms that aren't really nicely interacting. <coughs> that leads to, to energy being released as soon as you start the simulation. After the optimization, you see that, and they also, because they also shoot in different directions. Right? So they're like, sort of like bullets. Uh, after the optimization, so you see that there's quite a big change in the overall structure of the enzyme, because like, this is the raw model, this is the optimization. Then you see that uh, the, the, the different simulations, they, they move, but they don't move in all different directions. They move much more mellowly. Um, so this is, when you, when you look at, the, at all the shelf atoms, so basically the overall structure of the protein, you can, re oh, yes, and then just to show you, this is what one of those, the, the iron vector one, the mixed one, looks like. Uh, it, it, uh, well, you see it? Everything moving a little bit. Yeah. You can do the same analysis, the essential dynamics, also on a subset of your uh, of your atoms. So I also did it only on the uh, styrene, so the substrate binding residues. And then uh, you actually see that the, the change in conformation between the raw and the optimized model is much less. Uh, but you see that there's much more happening when you have the unoptimized, the raw model. Uh, in your simulation, because it, it really shoots away in different directions. So if you're just looking at the <coughs> structure of the binding site, if you do that for the optimized model, this is well behaved, it's just fluctuation, diffusive behavior. Yeah, so this is this is well behaved protein structure. This is a protein structure that starts with a lot of strain. You see the first step going out a lot in different directions. It's like uh, um, uh, like a bowling alley, right? When the where you hit the pins with your ball, they shoot off in different directions. Yeah, that's cool if you want to score a strike, but that's not what you expect your protein molecule to do. <coughs> not at normal temperature. Okay, just to show you what this looks like. Put the lights. Yeah. Uh, so here you see. Uh, so I've only analyzed the the residues here, not the, the uh, not the, back, the sorry the substrate and the cofactor. So you see uh, these atoms moving uh, 
uh, quite a bit yeah? okay. along this item. Um, right. Now, uh, so this actually allowed us to bind the, the ligand in the right orientation, that allowed us to understand a little bit about the mechanisms of this uh, interaction. The final thing I did, actually, my professor, uh, Nico Formella, uh, he was, he was bothering me about this for months. He said, analyze the water. Yeah, but it's so much work. It's just so much water. Uh, if you just have the, the protein and the, it's just like a few thousand atoms. But they've got 100,000 atoms in this system with all the water. Uh, in the end, I did it, and this is what I found. So here you have the, the styrene <coughs> substrate. Here you have the cofactor, the FAD, which is actually quite polar. And you see all the dotted lines are, uh, are hydrogen bonds with, with, with the protein uh, <laughs> over here and there. But what you also see, these small uh, spheres, those are water molecules. Um, and they were actually in the crystal structure as well. So of the homology, of the template that I built the homology model on. But I, we took them out during the homology modeling. Uh, but in the simulation, you just put water in, and then the water goes wherever it wants to go. This is where the water ends up during the simulation. Um, and it actually, it hydrogen bonds with the, 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 the diphosphate here, uh, with some other parts. But this is the important thing. Because this is uh, this residue is where the catalysis happens, so this is between this back backbone here and the styrene. But the, as you remember, the, it's an oxygen it's, it's an oxygenase, so the it actually builds an oxygen more uh, atom. So the catalytic mechanism needs water. This is how the water gets into the chemistry. And I didn't put the water there; it just went there during the simulation, which is cool. I looked up the original paper that described the crystal structure of the uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme. Um, and in, the, in the, that paper, they described the exact same binding uh, locations of these water molecules. So this is a nice way to validate uh, a part details of the chemistry of your homology model, that at least they're good enough that the water ends up in the place where it should uh, to support the catalysis. Okay really run out of time. Uh, there's just one thing I need to show you. It has to do with conversions. So if you simulate, uh, I, I told you RMSD. So, so I, I told you the first thing I do is principle of bone analysis. It's essential dynamics. Actually, I often first do RMSD analysis. And this is typically what you get if you simulate uh, a protein for a, a, a nanosegment or so. You see the RMSD going up, which is uh, which makes sense because you start from the crystal structure, you you bring it up to room temperature, you start simulating, things will change, right? And then it, it seems to <coughs> level out. So you think, okay, this is convergence, right? This could be convergence because now my 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 simulation is in a stable state and it's not changing. If you look at a different simulation, uh, which is a bit longer, you see similar behavior, right? It, it levels out after about half the simulation. Now the problem is, the previous plot was this nanosecond. So it doesn't converge. It looks like it's converged because of the scale of your plot. Because it, it levels off. The last half is always flatter than the first half. So it's not converged. It's just diffusing. If you plot diffusion, so that's you get quadratic. Um, so you also get logarithmic. The displacement as a function of time. That's in two dimensions. This is diffusion in your conformational space, which is multidimensional. So the, the, uh, the it's, it's a logarithm with a much steeper curve. Yeah. So it's just uh, it, this doesn't mean you're converse. And uh, if you look at uh, even shorter, so the first hundred picoseconds of the first simulation, you see exactly the same behavior. So uh, this the, I, I show you because there are still people publishing papers showing an RMSD plot of maybe 10 or 100 nanoseconds of a protein simulation, and we say, look, it's stable, and we've reached an equilibrium. This is BS. Yeah, I'll say it out loud. But this is BS. You, you know when you recognize an equilibrium? This is how you recognize an equilibrium. When you visit different states. 
repeatedly coming back to states that you've already seen. Because then you know, I, I told you, like Favo, right? Somebody who goes to Favo once, doesn't mean they like it. Yeah, but if they're, they're uh, two times a week for a year, yeah, then I don't know, you can survive that. But that, that probably means that they like it. Okay. Um, with that, we can, uh, well, we have to because we're out of time. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, I think we should best do that uh, during the technical, because there's people uh, wanting to come in uh, for the next one. Thanks. Yeah.